quick way to learn about food and wine matching mm -hmm. is sit down one day and have three different wines with the same dish. Yeah, and exactly. that, that is instantly how you'll understand that, wow, it does make a difference what wine you have with each each dish. Yeah. And so we do like to um, we do like to talk about specific dishes and what kind of wines I think go well and then we go ahead and taste them. You know, every person's taste is different. We all perceive and, and our palates are different. So for me what's important is that number one, a waiter talks about a wine in terms that they feel comfortable about, not the way I would speak about it, because right. that's going to come through. It's not going to seem natural, for, mm -hmm. but in the way that they, in the language that they feel comfortable about, and if they think that this wine is maybe too, too rich for this food, well, maybe I think it's the perfect wine for the food, but I want them to choose the one that they think is right, right for that dish, and so I'll give them some directions but then I'll expect them to make their own conclusions. Um, yeah. uh, we, I kind of lead the path, but then let them get to the goal by themselves. Yeah, that's, that's very smart. Let's talk about wine lists for a minute. Sure. And I have to tell you that there's a whole new trend in, in wine lists. Um, in LA, for example, some of the hot restaurants have like red, white, and they just list the red, and they use maybe verbs like zesty and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, sure. Sure. Um, how do you see a consumer-friendly way to create a wine list for well, a you know smaller restaurant? For, for a smaller restaurant, I, I, I do think it's important um, to if you don't have a sommelier on the floor, then it's important to use the wine list as the vehicle that transmits the information mm -hmm. to the customer. And obviously, mm -hmm. for many restaurants, don't have the luxury of having a sommelier. Yeah. So. The wine list becomes the vehicle for, for giving that information. So I think having, um, and, um, in fact, I'm developing a small list for, for um, our breakfast, lunch, and dinner mm -hmm. restaurant mm -hmm. that is much more friendly, that has descriptions, that talks about, you know, what the wine is, where it comes from, who makes it, mm -hmm. um, and what's it like. And right. basically, those will be, those are going to be the titles uh, underneath which wow. you're going to have the information and what what's it cost. Right. Um, so a bunch of W's. Yeah. Um, and but I, you know, I like to you know, I'm not always in favor of terms like yummy or outrageous or things things that don't have that that really don't have a precise meaning. Um, like, I, like blackberry scented, you know. Well, I like I like taste accented something like that. Is sure, that I, I I like giving a descriptive as far as what I think the weight of the wine is, how it feels. Does it feel light? Does mm -hmm. it feel full bodied? Uh, does it feel like it has a lot of alcohol or a lot of acidity? And what the primary flavor of the wine tends to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also talk about what kind of dish it would go well with right. in, in that in that description um, so uh, if we're talking about a Pinot Noir light lots of strawberries great mm -hmm. with uh, fowl mm -hmm. something some, something like that something that just gives you a brief rundown of what to expect and what it would be good with I don't like to get carried away with too many technical terms or too many terms that are too abstract right. and just just because they seem a little in vogue. I mean, all of a sudden, it's like totally outrageous right. or, or, yeah. I'm not quite convinced that those are necessarily friendly terms. Do you see this as a wave of the future, um, having these wine lists that are more informal, more direct to, you know, geared to the consumer? I, I, think, I think so, because especially if a restaurant isn't going to make the investment in a sommelier, then uh, otherwise, if you're going to pick a wine list that's interesting and to give a, and I think it's important to make a wine list interesting it gives your restaurant an added advantage over a competition you want you want to have a restaurant with great food great service and a great wine list and that doesn't necessarily mean a huge wine list but an interesting one is important and and to do that you have to make selections of, of things that not everybody has um, but in order to sell those things that nobody has and few people know about, then you've got to describe them in a way that people are going to want to try them. Exactly. Um, so I do think that that style of wine list is the wave of the future. Um, but I, I think... And also with younger consumers now, like the old guard is 
kind of moving on and and the younger people want <laughs> you know they're not used to the whole French tradition of like a, a, a wine list that weighs two pounds mm -hmm. on their table and having to go through it you know well, but in a sense those wine lists are much easier because in the old wine list you had Bordeaux you had Burgundy, you had Champagne, you had a few major areas and you had the Lafitte from 45, 49, 61 and you, you pretty much knew good vintage, the good vintages and, and the good chateaus and, and so but now you have wines from all over the place um, appearing even oddball areas in France that are now much more accessible you know wines from Languedoc and, and Mandarin and Jurançon areas that we never even heard about never mind had tasted 10 years ago yeah. apart from things from South Africa Africa, Argentina, yeah. Chile, um, other areas in Italy outside of Tuscany and the Piedmonte. So the wine world has become much more complicated. Yeah. Um, and you, and I, consumers have become more sophisticated as well. Right. And, the, you know, the, the media, the amount of, uh, you know, um, journals like the Wine Spectator, like the Wine Advocate or the Underground Newsletter, um, a lot of or this this new um, oh what's the there's a new one um, Wired mm -hmm. um, yeah. a number of journals that now appeal to a broad base of consumers mm -hmm. that have really educated consumers on a wide variety of wines so I think I mean the wine world is so much larger than it used to be so that I think even a, a small wine list today can appear to be much more complicated than a huge wine list of yesterday just because the choices are so much more. Maybe you won't have a bunch of vintages of, of a particular Cabernet Franc from the Loire, but you may have never heard of that Cabernet Franc from the Loire Valley before. Exactly. Now I have to tell the audience that um, tonight Emmanuel is leading a Bordeaux tasting. Yes. And if I just looked at the price, it would just shock you, but it's $900, $950 a person. Right. And my question to you is why is Bordeaux so expensive? <laughs> well, um, this is a uh, First of all, it's a tasting and a dinner, so okay, so, right. so Bon Porte uh, is preparing, I believe it's like an eight-course dinner, okay. um, and he's the chef of the dining room in the Great School of San Francisco, who does some really tremendous work. But apart from that, we're going to be having the best vintages of Chateau Aubryon, one of the most famous Bordeaux, um, and one of the great wine properties in the world from 1945 to 1995, wow. so 50 years of choosing the best vintages of this particular wine. Those wines, I, I can tell you that the 45 cost me $1,500 a wow. bottle. Wow. Um, just for, and that was my price. That, yeah. that wouldn't be the retail price. So, um, and even the 1995 is, uh, Aubryon is going for upwards of $300 at, at retail. So, yeah. even the youngest wine is a very expensive wine. Yeah. Apart from the fact that there'll be other great wines served during dinner, mm -hmm. a 55 Coburn Port. And, um, some Chateau Ycam, one famous Saturns, and um, some other great white wines and great champagne. So the thing, this is an opportunity, almost a once in a lifetime opportunity, where you're going to otherwise, if, if you were to go out and buy these wines, they'd probably cost you close to $10,000 uh, just for the wine sure, itself. Yeah. Um, you, you sound like me when I'm trying to convince my husband to take it. <laughs> <laughs> the air pair room is more expensive. No. That's true though. That's the, very true. The thing is, if you want to do this yourself, number one, I, I spent three and a half months looking for these wines. I mean, mm -hmm. these wines came from Southern California, from Northern California, from New York, and from Europe, mm -hmm. from Switzerland and England, to, to find uh, good bottles of, uh, of uh, some of the vintages. So, number one, it's something that the general consumer doesn't have that, that kind of um, uh, connections, connections yeah. with. But also, I mean, yes, you could buy the wines. They would cost a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, it would actually probably cost you a lot more money to put it on yourself than to come here and have it. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. And when I reflect on it, the um, I'm sure the shop has spent months, as many months as you, mm -hmm. trying to come up with something that will really match the notes of the wine and really highlight their individual characteristics. Well, we, we've we've done and so what we tried to do, and I, I sat down with Sylvan and we spent a few weeks talking about what we want to try to do with this, um, and we we decided we have a classic. Bordeaux property. We're going to go with classic Bordeaux dishes that match this thing. Mm -hmm. And so we research what would be some of the most classic and best dishes to go. So um, from 
uh, one of the most famous uh, dishes mm -hmm. in Bordeaux is lambre a la Bordelaise. Mm -hmm. So eels in yeah, a red wine sauce. Eel. <laughs> and so, you know, it's not easy to find go out and find eels and, and, and do some, but that's the kind of that's the kind of wow. dinner that we're going to have with uh, from from wonderful foie gras with sauternes at the beginning of the meal, yeah. which was the custom in England and France at the turn of the century, all the way through to these dishes that have been famous for so long. Um, and so it really is a unique opportunity and, and really based on the cost of the wines, uh, that what they would cost, it, $950 is a lot of money to yeah. pay for dinner. But for this dinner, it's not. Yeah, I agree. Now that you explained to me what, what goes into it, I, I do agree that I was just curious because you know, people think Bordeaux, they see the, at the wine store, it's not that much. But, sure. Um, but you start getting really, you know, the 61s, the 59s, yeah. those, those kind of vintages. Um, Bordeaux gets to be very, very expensive, especially from a top property. Okay. Well, you've been great. I have to just close with a kind of a, a question to you. As um, Master Sommelier, when you're celebrating an anniversary birthday, how do you celebrate? Do you choose a wine from your birth, or do you have any method to your to your my madness? madness? <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, I'm one of those unfortunate people that loves wine and was born in a lousy year, <laughs> at least for wine. Um, I actually was born in, in 1960, and 1960 is not necessarily a very renowned year for wine in general. Yeah. But there were some little, some people that did make very good wine. Um, so there was some decent port made in 1960. There's uh, some uh, some Spanish red wines that were made in 1960, which are quite good. Um, some Cabernets from California that were quite good. Mm -hmm. And through the years, I've been picking up a bottle here. When I see a bottle of 1960 something, oh, I, I, I pick it up and, and just for fun. And so, yeah, I'll probably have a, every, not every year because I don't have that many bottles of them, but every once in a while on my birthday, I do open. Uh, I think it's fun to have something from your year, something that's as old as you and, and you hope that you're as well developed as it is. <laughs> Um, rarely being the case, um, but uh, you, have, you hope you age as gracefully as some of the great wines, uh, well, from 1960, not necessarily, but even though there are some very nice wines, it's just much harder to find them. Uh, but I think it is fun to, to have something like, and then to have wines that you just like, yeah. um, that you just enjoy, or depending on who's going to come to dinner, or, or what, where you're going to have dinner, what you're going to have for dinner, those are all the things that for me enter into the equation of what wine I'm going to pick uh, for a particular occasion. Very well said. Emmanuel, you've been wonderful. Thank you're you so welcome. much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. Show.